This used to be a Dave's supermarket right here. It was the last grocery store within a walking distance in this neighborhood. And so with that closing down, it created a food desert. Um, so when we come out here, we hook up with our friend Jonathan Gray over at Trials for Hope and bring out food bags as well to this neighborhood in addition to our normal naloxone, fentanyl test strips, condoms, hygiene products, first aid supplies. It's also a very densely populated area with the apartment buildings, a lot of drug use, a lot of overdoses happening over here. Um, so we've worked with several agencies to identify this as a high risk area and so that's why we come out to do the outreach out here. In the U.S., there have been nearly one million opioid-involved overdose deaths since 1999. And in Cuyahoga County, where Cleveland is located, we lose two people to drug overdose death every day. Despite increased funding and our dedicated efforts, drug and alcohol addiction remain a huge problem in our communities. Today's epidemic is driven by illicit drug supply and unintentional poisonings, and clinicians remain integral in providing treatment and care to mitigate this crisis. There are many barriers to proper medical treatment, including stigma and bias that can endure for decades after a person seeks treatment. I'm Carrie Lang, a project manager funded by the CDC's Overdose Data to Action Grant working to stem the tide of opioid use disorders in Cleveland, Ohio. I paired up with Alec Hillier at the Center for Health Affairs to learn more about the experiences of medical professionals and people in recovery to underscore and demonstrate that addiction is a chronic disease that impacts us all rather than an individual's moral failing. It's through these stories that we can begin to understand the drivers of medical stigma, burnout, and explore various pathways to recovery. This epidemic has been ravaging our communities for too long. What we are doing is not working, and it will require new ways of thinking and all of us working together to bring an end to this epidemic. We must begin by igniting compassion. The history of addictive disease is really, really interesting. One part of the history of addictive disease really explains um, why in our community and our society we still stigmatize addiction so much. Addictive disease affects the behavior control center of the brain. So even though it's a biologic, partially genetic, partially environmental brain disease, um, the symptoms are wild and crazy behaviors. And so, before society knew anything about the genetics of addiction and the biology of addiction, all they saw were the behaviors of addiction. And therefore, um, it's considered a, a, a lack of, of morality, a lack of ethics, a lack of willpower. Because one out of 10 people have addiction. And nine out of 10 people just don't have it. And so if that one out of 10 can't behave like the nine out of 10, it must be their problem. When we're talking about stigma, we're talking about analyzing and identifying the ways that people are harmed because of how society treats people who use drugs um, and even people in recovery as well. It has an effect on their access to health care, even just seeing a doctor or a dentist, um, checking into a detox, getting any kind of medication for their health um, is a challenge. Talking about it openly is also a challenge because we've been taught by society as a whole how to teach people who use drugs and um, basically prioritized a criminalization slash punishment approach 
uh, which isn't helpful. For me, I think a huge issue in healthcare is still stigma. You can go through medical school without having one class on addiction. I just, I can't wrap my brain around that. One of the many barriers to getting care for a patient uh, is stigma. It is rare to meet a patient with a substance use disorder who does not have multiple stories of having to go for care and as soon as substance use comes up, they immediately see a change in the affect of the provider. I've definitely had a, uh, quite a few experiences that were negative um, by people who work in the treatment realm, healthcare professionals, um, and it really impacted my whole journey, really. While I was actively using, I contracted hepatitis C. Um, which only got worse, right? It only got worse, it doesn't get better by itself. So when I finally made it, where I felt like I was stable in recovery, I'm like, I wanna, I wanna figure this out. Like, what do I need to do? I started like Googling all the things, like what do I need to do? Who do I need to talk to? What kind of insurance do I need to have? Um, and I got denied multiple times for treatment because I was told for one, uh, you're not, in recovery long enough. And then two, we need to get at least a year worth of drug testing for you, like on file. Um, and then also there was the factor of like, you're not sick enough to even need this treatment yet. And I couldn't believe that I was really hearing that. And I'm just kind of like, is this, is this a thing? Like I'm doing all the right stuff. I'm in recovery. Um, it's been two years, which that was a long time for me. That was a really long time for me, but it was infuriating because I had already started to develop cirrhosis, which is hard to get rid of if you don't catch it soon enough. Ashley Rosser is a harm reduction specialist at Thrive for Change. She is also in recovery. That journey began in 2018, a journey marked by treatment barriers and stigma. It illustrates how clinical compassion and accessibility to treatment can reduce the burden of chronic disease for individuals and communities. Sadly, Ashley's story about hepatitis C treatment is not unique. Across the country, hepatitis C cases are common in people who inject drugs, and depending upon insurance, the treatment for hepatitis C can be nearly unattainable. Innovations have led to improved treatment, and recent national guidelines recommend that treatment be extended to new populations, specifically people who are actively using drugs or in recovery. Similar to Ashley, Sarah Zeligowski's recovery journey saw relapses, setbacks, and stigma. Sarah shared her story with us, supported by her parents, Gary and Joanne. But several incidents occurred when we were trying to get Sarah into a treatment. I got one very nasty comment that said, we don't take that welfare insurance. And so in other words, go somewhere else. And that to me was just dead wrong. I mean, these people need help just as much as anyone else. Then after uh, Sarah had been, I think after you had been through treatment, and you went for um, physical to start a new job and she still had tracks on her arm. And it was uh, probably a physician's assistant that was working with her. And he said, wow, that's a nasty scar you got there. And she came out and she was telling me about it. She was like, he didn't even know, he didn't know. And then the big issue was she had uh, a broken elbow and a surgery to follow, and she came home with 70 Percocets. And I know the people who gave them to her didn't realize what they were doing, but that was devastating. When asking individuals in recovery about their experiences, they relayed an urgency for improving clinician-patient communication 
a critical dialogue that allows patients and providers to work as a team. There's many people who go to their primary care doctor and they you know, go home at night and they drink a gallon of vodka. No one asked them. So you don't know that that's technically an addiction patient because they haven't been asked, you know? So sometimes it's just really getting in there and asking the really good intense questions and, you know, to get to know your patient better. We don't have usually that much problem asking about a lot of very personal issues. What are your bowel movements like? How often do you urinate? How are your sexual relations? Extremely personal related, but we can ask those commonly openly because we're concerned about the health. If we can learn to ask in the same open-minded way, non-judgmental. I've noticed you've been using a lot of uh, pain medications and we don't want you being in pain. Do you have any concerns about your use? and then I need to listen. We're all very well trained at teaching and being expository. But as we've heard in many areas of medicine, we have to improve our listening skills and then listen to the patient openly and not judgmentally. What we're trying to do as a whole is unlearn, relearn, right, and collaborate with each other. Um, so if that's something that anybody can do, it's just walking away feeling open-minded, like they can have these conversations with each other and not be afraid to have them too, of course. Today, Dr. Ted Perrin is a celebrated physician dedicating a lifelong career to addiction medicine. But in 1985, Dr. Perrin was the chief medical resident at Baltimore City Hospital, where he reluctantly performed medical consults at a newly established detox unit. I first got interested in the area of uh, working with people with alcohol and drug problems against my will. Um, uh, I was the medical chief resident at Baltimore City Hospital in 1985, and they opened a big detox unit run by a clinical pharmacologist who knew a tremendous amount about drug and alcohol problems but knew nothing about medical problems. And they couldn't find a single living soul in the Department of Medicine at Johns Hopkins or Baltimore City Hospital who for pay was willing to go to the detox unit once a day and do medical consults. So they made me do it. Um, after about six months of loudly proclaiming that I was heading for the den of iniquity every day when I went to the detox unit, I'm embarrassed to say, um, I began to realize that the patients on the detox unit were, um, were dressing themselves and they were making their beds and they were saying yes please and no thank you to the nurses and they were acting like patients. And those same people, many of whom were HIV positive at the time, with endocarditis up on the medical and surgical services were literally throwing urinals at, uh, at, the, at the house staff. Um, and I asked the, uh, Dr. Jasinski, who ran the detox unit, why did patients with addiction act like patients on his service and act like something other than people on the med surge services? And he said, because we treat them like patients. We take their withdrawal serious. We try to keep them as, as comfortable as humanly possible. And we give them the highest quality addiction care. At the same time, we give them the highest quality medical. And he went on to say that up on the med surge services here at City Hospital and, and also the detox unit at Hopkins, you guys provide the best medical and surgical care available on earth. And you ignore their addictions. And they go into withdrawal and they start to hurt. And you label them as drug-seeking addicts and you retreat as doctors. And they sign out against medical advice. And he said that's no way to treat a human being. Uh, and that really was my first in-my-face introduction to how stigma plays an essential role in the mistreatment, maltreatment, and undertreatment of people with drug and alcohol problems. So, if dismantling stigma is a key to correcting mistreatment of drug and alcohol addiction, what treatment strategies are optimal in aiding these patients through recovery? 
In 1987, two years after Dr. Perrin's introduction to that detox unit, the American Medical Association affirmed that addiction is a disease of the brain, and in more recent years we know is treatable with MOUDs or medications for opioid use disorder. Could these medications be, like hepatitis C treatments, a tool for clinicians treating addiction? We decided to reach out to other clinicians, including Dr. Sybil Marsh, a family medicine physician with a focus in addiction medicine, about the efficacy of addiction treatments available today. You know, there was a time when people said, I don't believe in methadone because it's just swapping out one addiction for another. You know, or I don't believe in medications for substance use disorder. I only believe in the 12-step approach. Um, what we know now is the evidence says using a variety of approaches is going to work better and that in fact um, when people use a medication for an opioid use disorder, whether it's methadone, whether it's buprenorphine naloxone, um, or whether it's long-acting naltrexone, um, they do better. They have more days when they don't use opioids. If they do use opioids, they use less, and they're, they're less likely to have an overdose death. That's the kind of scaffolding on which all the rest of their recovery can, can happen. Very common aphorism in chemical dependency, which I still adhere to today, is there's no one thing that works for everybody, but for everybody, there's something that works. And for some people, the substance, buprenorphine or suboxone, uh, can be beneficial. These medicines can be given just by themselves to people, especially with opiate addiction, and they decrease the death rate by more than 70%. So all by themselves, these medicines can be very useful from a harm reduction, from a avoiding death perspective. And in 2020, the um American Society of Addiction Medicine um, actually kind of made a treatment recommendation that there was enough evidence to say every treatment program should involve um, one of those medications and preferably the one that is, is going to be the, the most likely to be a good fit for a particular patient. Sometimes we don't have that flexibility, but when we do, we could say, use any of those medications, they're all gonna um, be helpful for the patient. I think that it's important that it's just like a medication you take every day for some other chronic illness or diagnosis that you have. Dosing, frequency, duration, induction, those things will change on a fairly common basis, especially today when there's a lot of research being done remains true and changes much more slowly is first our understanding of the biochemistry involved, the neurobiochemistry, the socioeconomic factors, the psychology of chemical dependence. Those change more slowly, but do change. And what changes least frequently is why we do it. And the reason we do it is because the person with chemical dependency is the human being that has a right to care that can help them live a life that they choose to leave rather than have their illness control their life. This was before I was born. Mm -hmm. 61. I was born for this. I was in high school. <laughs> yeah. Year before I got sober, 96. My name is Tanya Williams, and I am a licensed social worker, and also I hold a licensed chemical dependency counselor. Three. I have a sobriety date of 72397, so I've been in recovery for a little over 25 years. You know, as a recovering person, the things that would have me like feeling unsuccessful don't occur. 
in my life. I just don't allow negativity to have any room in my life. And as a result, it makes me feel success. And what it looks like, we could be here all day because my life is just so great right now. And like I said, even when death occurs or loss of something occurs, it doesn't take away from my success. It's powerful to understand that there are many strategies to treat substance use disorder. Recovery is a lifelong journey, and to hear from people in recovery leading healthy lives that they choose to lead is an inspiration, a reminder of what's possible when different groups work together and clinicians set their patients up for success. When I was new to recovery and trying to get into recovery, there were times when mentally I needed support. In that respect, I can understand where the client is at, you know, um, whether or not I've seen this client several times. Personally, it took me several times um, to recover and stay in recovery. So I utilize my journey um, to help others just because I remember where I came. The thing I treasure most about my recovery journey is um, finally feeling quote unquote normal. Um, the highs and lows are easier to navigate and there is um, a steady stream of peace through my life. I forget the days of the week, but it was our, our visitation day, I think, was Wednesday, and Christmas was Thursday, so we thought we were going to see Sarah on Wednesday, and we could do Christmas with the family on Thursday. And like Monday or Tuesday, we got a note or a phone call or something that said, no visitation Wednesday this week, all visitations are going to be on Thursday. And we're like, well, now what do we do? Because we got right at visitation time was when we had 20, next, people, coming to 20 people coming to our house for Christmas dinner, and it was a hard decision, but we said, you know what? We were coming Wednesday, they changed it on us, and Sarah's there because of, she's working on her issue and part of what she has to own. We have two other kids too, we need to, you know. But the whole holiday experience of Sarah being in that particular time in, re in rehab is why, to this day, Project White Butterfly in early years when we didn't have two dimes to rub together, we figured out a way to go to treatment centers and make Christmas for those people. Sarah told us she was pregnant. She was a year clean. Um, and words you don't want to hear when you're, or don't want to speak when you hear you're becoming a grandmother are, you gotta be kidding. Um, but those were my words. And it was real because we were at that trust inflection point. Sarah was like a year clean at that time. And for us, it was binary. This was either going to be cause to continue on the good side or a stressor that pulled Sarah back to the dark side. And thankfully, it was that. And now when she comes for Christmas, she brings this very cool little boy with her. And it's that's the light. And that's... Those are the things that you try and envision and see on the other side when you're going through the darkness. Engaging in treatment is what helps give back things. When people say, you know, I, my children are now living with us. Uh, my, my wife is back. I'm allowed back in the house. I, I was able to obtain a job and hold it. And I'm now able to contribute. And I'm not, you know, I'm not living in a shelter. I'm not you know, couch surfing, I'm not depending on others to help me get from day to day. So there was just, it came a time like after my last overdose and I'm just like, okay, so something has to change. Like I can't keep um, trying the same thing over and over and it not work for me. Like I have to look for something else. Um, so what I did was I got, I signed myself up for like intensive outpatient and I started learning about like, what does it actually mean, like, to be on medication-assisted treatment? And I didn't tell anybody about it for a few years, too, because of the stigma that exists. 
So I was still like holding all of that in, secretly going to a doctor to get medication, not telling anybody about it because I was afraid of the pushback. Um, and it was probably two years ago that I started feeling okay with telling people because what it did for me was it took away the fear that I had that I was going to like use again and overdose again, ultimately. So when I am on MAT, Suboxone specifically, um, it just, it takes that away so I can think about other things. I, I put recovery first. It's hard to stay sober if you don't know how to stay sober. Um, if you don't know how to stay sober for a period of time, maintaining the abstinence is hard. Staying sober has been good for me. I mean, I have my ups and downs. Life shows up. Um, 16 years in recovery, my, um, my mother passed away. And um, the blessing was that, that she got 16 years of her son not hearing about me being in jail, not hearing about me being in the hospital, not, not worrying about me being in the streets. Um, you know, um, she knew where I was at then. One of the things that happened since I've been sober is I had three beautiful children out of the deal. And I try to figure out, they never seen me drunk. They never heard about my addiction. I mean, they never see me in active addiction, put it that way. Um, but um, they, they don't know what it's like. They know I've been working in rehabs all my recovery. So in 1995, I got a job at called Fresh Start. One of the um, counselors there, or supervisors, named Sim Bodie, said, I think you should get into counseling. You're, um, you're very passionate about recovery. And my passion for recovery is deep because you can't save everybody. But if you get one, you feel great. Understanding the urgent need for harm reduction in Cleveland both Ashley and Sarah took to grassroots organization. Their lived experience and passion have led to the founding of two local and essential harm reduction and recovery organizations, Thrive for Change and Project White Butterfly. Um, I've been in recovery for over six years now, and I do a lot of harm reduction work um, in the community, so educating about uh, the importance of knowing what it looks like when you see an overdose, how to respond, what the next steps are, and everything in between. So before people want to enter recovery or choose a pathway, whatever that might be, I'm like right there while people are still using drugs and providing them support. And tonight we are at our place with the letter R in Cleveland, Ohio. And what we're doing is we're offering a free public training um, so folks can come in, learn about naloxone, how to use it, recognize an overdose, and also become Narcan distributors themselves too. Telling me, you know, hey, this is something called Narcan and it could save someone's life in the event of an opiate overdose. That's exactly what I needed. So it took me quite a few times of like bouncing in and out of recovery and failing um, before, you know, I decided to try it my own way. So I would say in 2018 is when I started looking into other options. Then I found harm reduction and I learned about the spectrum of harm reduction and it kind of went from there. So the name Project White Butterfly, again, accidentally started all of this, right? My boyfriend's brother in 2018 died from an overdose. Um, he had gotten cocaine that had fentanyl in it. And the day that he died, everybody was, you know, just in shock and gathering at our house. And it was a beautiful summer day, um, super sunny, really nice outside. We were all outside kind of milling around the yard and there was a white butterfly that kept flying around and like a few people had noticed it that day. Um, and somebody said, oh look, it's Justin, he got his wings. But then fast forward to 2019, some other friends and I in recovery were just really heavy with the losses that summer. And so we decided to start making these cards with handwritten messages in them, um, something encouraging. And then we picked the treatment centers, well, the detox centers that typically got people in the fastest because we knew how important it was that when somebody called and wanted to get in somewhere that 
that they would take them quickly. So we started putting those phone numbers in cards and put the white butterfly on there. And we were just joking around. We are like, oh, this is Project White Butterfly. And we posted it on social media, just like as a mission basically that we were doing to hang those cards up. And it snowballed. <laughs> Recovery restores to people their livelihood, their family and friends, and their community. Provide compassionate care, listen with empathy, and use tools such as medications for opioid use disorder that are now broadly available for prescribers to give hope and give back to people what they once thought they lost. Clinicians have such great power to work alongside people in recovery to support recovery, and to practice the art and science of medicine through warmth, sympathy, and understanding, and to ask for help if it's needed. We hope that connecting with these stories and seeing addiction and recovery from a new lens will inspire you to grow, to openly communicate, to discover whatever treatment strategies work best for people, to ignite compassion. Thank you.